what did they rename muscle fitness muscle fiction i think once somebody said that one time but you're right it, it the, the size of the muscle is is predetermined at birth based on its origin to insertion the length of it and the uh the longer the tendon, the smaller the muscle length, or shorter the muscle length, and of course, the longer the muscle length, the shorter the tendons. And if you look at the these bodybuilders, they have the superior genetics for most of those muscles to have that potential size, and they have to develop it, obviously. So. Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity. With your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount, discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hi guys, I'm Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training workouts for maximum results and start and grow your strength training business. My former guests include the who's who of high intensity training, including Dr. Doug McGuff and Drew Bay, paleo pioneers Mark Sisson and Rob Wolf, diet and metabolism expert Dr. Ted Naiman, successful strength training entrepreneurs like Luke Carlson and Roger Schwab and everything in between. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to talk to you about the Corporate Warrior Membership. This is a membership that I've designed to help you get the best results from your high intensity training and or start and grow your strength training business with exclusive access to a very high quality podcast and digital content, amazing community, one on one coaching from me and exclusive discounts on high intensity training products like courses, exercise equipment, workout gear events and more. To learn more about that, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash membership. This is probably the most exciting project that I've worked on today. It's the one way that I feel like I can have a huge impact on the high intensity training community, but also build some kind of sustainable business model um, that enables me to increase my impact and continue doing what I love. Um, I really feel quite strongly that the best way we can improve the, I guess, the awareness of high intensity strength training is by becoming excellent case studies. So building amazing health individually, um, but also building successful businesses. That doesn't mean necessarily building huge businesses, but building, you know, it could be a single studio that's very profitable, or you could do what Luke's trying to do and build a huge brand. And I guess that's very impactful for as well. Uh, But it's just trying to create a community where I can help influence and improve um, both of those groups of people. My guest today is the high intensity legend, Jim Flanagan, who joins me for a part two. Jim was Arthur Jones's right hand man for 36 years. He was instrumental in the launch and growth of both Nautilus and Medics. And for those that don't know, they are both providers of high end strength training machines. 
In 2017, Jim was inducted into the National Fitness Hall of Fame. Jim is one of the most charming, humble and generous people I've ever spoken with. This was further reinforced when I met him at the Resistance Exercise Conference, where he was continuously crediting others with much of his progress he made in the strength training industry. His fondness for other experts at the conference was really lovely to see, um, as when I'd be talking to someone, he'd kind of run up and, and, you know, Dr. Ted Ted Dreisinger comes to mind and Jim would say, you know, this guy's... This guy's excellent. You really should get him on your show. And he's constantly thinking about other people and helping others, which is really nice to see. In this episode, we talk about the exercise machine industry, the challenges that the uh, manufacturers of exercise machines have and face today, how to go about starting a strength training business, what it was like training Casey Viator, uh, Jim's personal workout and much, much more. For all the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash podcast. Don't forget to hang around at the end of this for your free gift from me. And now I give you round two with the one and only Jim Flanagan. Jim, welcome back to Corporate Warrior. It's a pleasure having you back on the show. Thank you for having me. So um, obviously, last time we spoke, uh, we got into your you know your background and your history with Arthur Jones, which was really really fascinating. You told us some really fun anecdotes from that time, uh, and there were some really wise lessons that came out of that. And I I certainly enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm sure the listeners did as well. Um, there was a lot of stuff I didn't cover with you because I prefer I always prefer to go deep on subjects as opposed to skimming the surface. Um, but the fortunate thing is we've got this opportunity now to do kind of a part two and explore some of those other areas um, and one of the topics I'd love to cover quick is this topic of kind of um, the work uh, and consideration that goes into the design and development of exercise machines you know, you've been in that industry for many many years um, and I'd love to know you know when you're doing kind of uh, prototyping or developing new machines how do you go about doing that what are those considerations that come up for you um, no, I, I never was directly involved in prototyping. I was in the sales side and the marketing side, but I was around it. And uh, with Arthur Jones, what I saw was just um, trial and error, cut and try, uh, test, retest. Uh, it literally, I saw sometimes as many as 100 prototypes built and scrapped over time. And then uh, uh, he would solve one or two problems, and another two or three problems would come up. For example, his first knee testing machine was built in the middle 70s. And I remember taking, I think I mentioned last time, I took a professional baseball player, and we tested his quads individually. And that unit still sticks out in my mind compared to what was out there by competitive products in the market in the uh, late, the middle 70s. It made those toys, those products look like teacher toys, <laughs> and I, because it was this thing was built so solid, yet it had up to a thirty degree potential error in its development and testing. And he never released it because it did have error in it, and he pointed it out that other products had a lot of error in them, but nobody seemed to know or really catch on. So I had to respect that, hey, he didn't rush into production, and that ended up being the last machine ever introduced under the Medex name in the uh, early, early, late 70s, or, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, that was the knee testing machine for the quads, and uh, I had to respect that. Uh, you, you know, you, you, I mean, you don't, you, you don't put something out there, he wasn't going to put his name on it unless it was right. So uh, having said that, I may have shared this story with you in the last uh, conversation. Uh, there was a uh, a big trade show in uh, Las Vegas in the 90s, and uh, Arthur was kind of reclusive. Uh, he was winding down, uh, was just worn out, and he flew to it because they gave him the Man of the Year Award or something, and he got on the stage, and I think we shared this last time. He said that uh, they presented a nice little plaque for him, and he basically got the microphone and started going off with people and uh, about how disappointed he was in the whole industry. It's, it hasn't evolved to another level. It's uh, uh, I counted 38 companies that violated my work, copied my uh, patents, and stole my work, and I'm very disgusted and hurt by it. And uh, he walked off the stage. And, and 
So he was a he was a man of uh, convictions. He was a man of principles, uh, a tough man, uh, brilliant in what he accomplished. He made a major contribution back then. But today, uh, uh, there's probably at least 50 companies out there building equipment. Uh, and I don't know what they're doing as far as design. I don't know. That, I know they don't have the uh, the mathematical formulas that Arthur Jones came up with, and we still have those under our engineers that are basically retired now. Uh, to me, to me, the overall industry is uh, machines are diluted a little bit. They're scaled down because of steel costs, things like that. And the whole key is. The old comment, which you saw in print for years and years and everything you wrote, function dictates design. And uh, I've had a lot of conversations with some of the guys that were around back when, uh, way back when. Kim Wood, who was early on, who was Arthur Jones's confidant in the first four to five years, the whole, evo- the, the whole process of Nautilus, he single-handedly launched uh, the, the equipment in the professional ranks of football the college level, he was uh, phenomenal what he accomplished uh, as a distributor. And uh, it, it goes back to basics that if people really understood what Nautilus really represented, because muscle function doesn't change, you'd still be using those tools today. You can refine them by some of the technology that evolved in the last 25 years with uh, less friction and uh, better bushing systems, things like that. You just retrofit those machines and have the best tools in the world to train with, but that hasn't happened. So I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a crazy business when it comes to that. So, but, and the other problem is, and I'll say this, I, what I, what I noticed uh, after we sold Nautilus was that, uh, Companies rushed into the uh, positions to try to take over the market share, and they started offering huge discounts. And once you start doing that, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Right, yeah, because then you start, you're starting competing on price, not the quality of the product, right? In it, yes, and, 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 and compound that with there's no, uh, there's no training protocols. I don't care how you use the machines, which, which puts you as a manufacturer in a greater liability risk if something gets hurt. So. Yeah. Uh, I feel this is such a – apologies to cut you off there, Jim. Sorry, what do you say? No, it, it just puts you in a position of uh, liability. Uh, we, we're such a litigious society, so you have to consider those things too. Yeah, yeah. this is such an important discussion, uh, and I hope that this show and interviews of you will um, hope, help shed some light on this issue about the existing – uh, health and fitness industry and the problems with regards to the quality of the machines out there, um, which are, for the most part, not up to scratch at all um, and nowhere near as sophisticated as the designs that obviously you and, and Arthur uh, invented and launched. Um, what went wrong? Why Why is it? Why has this happened? Well, he, he got out of it. Uh, he sold uh, Nautilus in uh, 1986 and then... Uh, Bought, got, got the rights back for the medical designs and decided to start that new company, which we did in 87, September of 87. Uh, he, he got older, obviously, aged. He got tired, and uh, I think he got tired of dealing with people because he he put 100% in everything he did, and uh, uh I can't speak for him now. He's no longer with us, obviously, but uh, uh, he he fought a lot of uphill battles and uh, trying to educate people. I mean, he spent man hours of uh, writing, uh, expressing uh, research, opinions, uh, personal experiences, self-observation, all those things mixed into one. But it was he took a very uh, logical approach in the educational process. Of uh, regardless of whether you bought his machines or not, uh, he basically taught you how to use a barbell properly from a fitness standpoint and building strength and getting stronger and uh, increasing your quality of life by, you know, being in the best shape of your life with the tools you have. So, 
It always it seems to me like you know the what, what, so many questions come up for me just now when you were talking. Um, you know, one thing that is it seems seems to be the case uh, to me is that he wasn't really necessarily into this concept of minimal viable product. You know, he was like, this thing isn't going out into production until it is absolutely 100% perfect. Um, and I'm going to sacrifice whatever short-term gain by by optimizing that and making sure it's right. Um, it, 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 is it fair that it, it sounds like Arthur wasn't massively motivated by money. It was more about impact. Well, I think uh, that's a good comment because uh, he had so many diverse backgrounds where he made a lot of money and it just didn't seem to be about the money. I mean, he would make it and spend it and uh, end up broke or whatever and go don't move to something else. Uh, but he, he got into the commercial side of it and he was very suspicious and very uh, he wasn't sure even more. He wouldn't even wanted to do that. And uh Actually, uh, the the former bodybuilder, Bill Pearl, who they had a pretty long relationship over the times from the 50s on, uh, told him that, uh, Arthur, if you don't put your name on it, don't take credit for it, somebody else will. And early on, if you look at some of the early articles uh, in the magazines, Iron Man and uh, um, a couple of muscular development, it was by Art Jones. And then the company was Arthur Jones Productions for the early, early 70s until he changed the name to Nautilus Sports Medical Industries. And he was hesitant, but he did it and uh, single-handedly uh, took the industry to a level that nobody had ever been to before. Obviously, the timing was was right on and uh, people were looking for something unique and it was a very unique time and a unique product. I mean, you, you were, as you said, you were in sales. So I imagine you got very good at describing the kind of features and benefits of the new machines. You know, I had a, a, a almost 10, 10 year long career in technology sales in London myself. So I'm, I, I'm a, you're a man of my own heart with regard to that. So, um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear, you know, how, I mean, you, you talked before about you did some very big deals, uh, in terms of, selling uh, exercise equipment to various companies um how can you talk us through like how what that experience was like in terms of differentiating you know nautilus and medex versus some of the other um uh, brands that you were up against back then well we arthur jones had a certain approach and i, I viewed that because i was close by i lived about 32 miles from where he had his offices so i was uh, very fortunate to be able to go up there Anytime I had free time and, and just hang around, I became a sponge like a lot of us. We wanted to learn. We were, we had a passion for it. Um, even though we were byproducts of the barbells and dumbbells, because that's all they had up to that time. They had a universal machine, a Marcy machine, those two competitive products that basically, as you know, um, copied the barbell and they had a waist stack and a cable, and it made exercise uh, more of a circuit type workout, but it actually wasn't as efficient as a barbell uh, and he still had the limitations of the barbell not fitting the human body so as you know arthur jones identified the 10 requirements necessary to build tools around the human body and he pointed those out early on and those 10 requirements uh basically uh you had to teach people the understanding the basics of uh why these tools are designed like they are to uh to give you a more efficient workout uh, through a greater range of motion, and you're going to work a higher percentage of muscle fiber than you would because you're working a greater range of motion based on muscle function. And uh, he, he designed those tools to make exercise harder because he realized that by making exercise harder, you have a greater guarantee of stimulation to change the body. But once you do that, then you must allow the recovery phase to take place. And very few people even knew about that. I mean, that's why you see all these magazine articles, even today, all this split routine and five days a week. I mean, the people spend so much time in the gym. How do they have How do they do their job? They can't be working out hard. They've got to because they're working out longer and they're not getting recovery. And I always tell people that's like being on a treadmill going nowhere. So, uh, but you have to take, uh, you have to take the cup and empty the cup to learn. You have to look and digest, assimilate, 
and apply certain things to your situation based on the tools you have. So, yeah, it is a wise word. Um, okay, this is this is this is interesting. So, uh, no, no, I completely agree with what what you're saying, um, and I think you know, looking at the the exercise equipment industry now, you know, you've got uh, obviously there's still you know. Nautilus and Medex are still fairly ubiquitous. There's still plenty of high intensity training um, or strength training businesses out there that are utilizing that kit um, and they love it, you know, uh, and they are huge uh, proponents of it. Um, and then you've got the likes of um, X Force and ARX and some of these kind of newer um, equipment manufacturers pushing, you know, trying to grow their businesses. Um, it would seem to me. Well, it looks like from what I'm seeing in terms of the, the, their online content that Nautilus and Medex and now they're under different ownership. They're not necessarily pushing the same message that you guys were back in the day. Um, do you think that, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit ignorant about the industry as a whole, but do you think there's an opportunity at the moment for someone to design or, or take, take the, the torch, so to speak, from you and Arthur with regard to the gravity based, you know, machines that you guys, uh, promoted before you know the medics well, and nautilus movement let me clarify I, I didn't i never designed anything i sold it uh I, I i i was just one of the spokes in the wheel there were a lot of good people that really contributed to make nautilus successful arthur jones it was his show his deal he was explaining to me very early on uh when i got hired with him i think i mentioned this to you before he told me two things don't second guess me and don't ever yes me I understood the rules real simple, and I never had a problem. But there were a lot of good people that committed uh, their lives to do the job that was required, and it was a great run. But having said that, back to your question, the problem today, Lawrence, is that in the field of exercise and fitness, even today, everybody has an opinion. All right, some of them are some opinions are worthless. Some of them are counterproductive, and some of them are extremely dangerous. So having deal with you're dealing with that, you got people that have those opinions. You're not going to change most of them. They they think they know, and that's and and then you have a uh, you have a sedentary population today in our society. We become too, uh, and I'm I'm talking from a physical edu- educator standpoint. Uh, we we sit too much. We're on a computer too much. We're on our cell phone too much. We're not, we're not active. And, and as a result, in this country, I see a, an epidemic of obesity, overweight people in their, in their teens and 20s now, which when I was growing up, we didn't have that. It was rare. I mean, you know, everybody's different, and uh, but you've got to deal with the cards you're dealt. So having said that, Today, there's over 50 companies out there. I don't know who's making a bunch of money. They're all trying to bundle and package and one-stop shopping and discounts and this and that. Then you got the uh, at the university level, you got all these. Uh, you have to do bids and this and that. Well, back in the day, you, if they wanted it, they bought it. Today, it's uh, it's 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 like uh, you're you're in mud trying to move against the mud to get to get where you need to get to and. Uh, it's complicated, and it's just it, everything's been everything's becoming so complicated. But to answer your question, yeah, the, the, there's a there's business out there. Uh, there's a need. Uh, they've they've lost the focus of trying to teach and educate people, and uh, everybody's got a certification course now. I mean, everybody they're making money on it. It's a money maker, just like uh, if you look at the National Football League, the combine. They have the combine for all these. These athletes are superior because of their genetics, uh, their abilities, their leverage, their strength. All these things are there's components of their their skill at. They have a niche, and some of those things you can't teach. You're 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 born with those potential uh, uh, traits, and uh, but somebody's making money on it. Uh, the forty yard dash. How how can you jump? Oh, yeah, yeah. How, how many times can you bench press two twenty five? It's got nothing to do with football, but they all show up, but they do what they're told, and it's a big money maker. Well, same thing in this uh, certification courses. Well, what? Who makes those people the experts? I mean, we gave we, we, you would come to us. We would teach you how to work out in the safest manner, the most efficient manner, in the least amount of time, and give you p- the potential results were way above anything else. And people don't get it. 
So it's it's just it's frustrating. I, and I always say, you know, I, I was real blessed to be around this and to get to coach people. I didn't get to coach a sport in, in, in my career, but I got to coach a lot of people, and I got paid to do it. And I had a gratifying result because I helped somebody, and that was a great run. But it also carries a curse with it because we 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 won a lot of battles, but we didn't win the big war, you know. So, yeah, yeah and I guess that the pendulum swung the other way at the moment. It would seem, um, yeah, not in not in the favor of what you're talking about, which is a real shame. And yeah, no, I agree entirely. And uh, you know, it's a shared it's a shared uh, concern, obviously, among a lot of the community uh, in sort of the high intensity training or, or evidence based resistance training. Um, you know, obviously, gravity based equipment, for want of a better label, um, is, is kind of makes up most of the exercise equipment around today. Um, that's starting to change with the likes of, um, ARX with, uh, you know, uh, the motors they use to, to drive the force within the machine and the electric motors. Um, I'm just curious, like, how are you? I mean, you sound a little bit. I don't think you mind me saying this, Jim. You sound a little bit pessimistic and disappointed. Um, but do you think that are there any kind of sparks out there in the kind of um, exercise equipment industry or machines that you're quite optimistic about? And and also, how do you see it evolving from here? Do you think? Well, I uh, um, I saw I saw X Force come out several years ago uh, with Matt Stulen, a real nice man, had very success on his own right. I have great respect for him, and uh, I, I tried the tools uh, at several of the trade shows. I gave him some advice, and um, based on my experience, that's all. I, you know, it's all all you can do, and uh, it hasn't taken off, not like they thought. And and it's it's it's, it's a great concept, and I think if Arthur Jones had stayed with the uh, eccentric loading phase and could have got close, he would have done something with that back in his day. Uh, the, the problem today is and uh, that you've got electronics, motor-driven, which means just like the treadmill business, and if you've seen the treadmill business, there's going to be there's going to be breakage and downtime. Who's going to repair it? That's a big, you got to have that in place. Then you got the cost factor. Well, the cost factor is, uh, I know from our, our business, Medex, during my tenure, was the most expensive machines out there. So that, that narrows down your niche market because not everybody's going to buy them. And um, that's true. Uh, then you've got uh, the eccentric loading factor, which I'm very uh, high on. I, I, I understand it. We use it. We use a lot of eccentric loading for strengthening uh, the general population that comes off the street. They don't like to be sore and all and pain. If they have any kind of pain, they're not used to that, and it's it's tough. The results are great if you can withstand the side benefit of being sore. So you have to look at all those things, and uh, I think it's a great product. Unfortunately, uh, the, the cost factor is prohibitive, and of course, the downtime. If you invest in it, you got to, who's going to repair it? Who's going to take? You got to be careful. So, but you have to know there's risk when you go into it. But I wish him uh, lots of luck. I know uh, my friend Joe Cerulli and my friend Roger Schwab are both involved, and uh, they'll do very well because of their reputation, uh, what they've accomplished. Uh, they both have a presence in the industry that's very high, and uh, I've got great respect for both of those guys and their personal friends and customers in the past. So, uh, but yeah, there, there is there is there is the timing's right to come in and step up, but it, uh, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice and see everybody. They don't, people don't see what it takes to get from point A to point B. They see the end result. But I'll tell you what, Arthur Jones, I was around in the seventies and, uh, I saw him, the whole thing evolve. And it was like, like, like I said, in our last interview, the, the electricity, the chemistry, the, just the, the, the enthusiasm was just unbelievable. But this guy was, he wore himself down. It took seven years before he really made any money. And he almost didn't make it. There were several times he almost didn't pull it off 
but you would never know it because this guy had such tenacity to drive it home. He never backed off. I mean, he was all the way or nothing on anything he did. And, uh, I, I don't know that there's somebody out there that can do that at that level today it would put the sacrifice in the time that he did. And, uh, I mean, I could tell you stories about that for hours about uh, the guy never slept. I mean, he just, you know, he wore himself out. He would go all day, all night. And, uh, that was part of our modus operandi. When you had somebody come down, you were there, to, you were with them day and night, dinner, lunch, breakfast, pick them up in the motel at eight o'clock, go get breakfast. You had them all day long. And you, uh, you're, you're, you're lecturing, you're talking, answering questions, going through workouts. We did all this. And, uh, that was part of the protocol of selling the equipment. You, you, you taught them, you educated them and you, and, which was a motivating tool, which they're not getting any place else at that time. So anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, he's a one of a kind, an absolute genius, and a brilliant man, as you described last time we spoke. Um, and yeah, I don't know if there is anyone out there like him today, or, or whether there will be for a very long time, um, who can who can kind of have that type of impact in this industry specifically. Um, obviously, there's a lot of great people out there today, anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just. I'm just curious whether or not, like, it's interesting hearing you talk about the industry because, um, uh, I guess I'm not, you know, I'm not part of the uh, equipment industry, so I don't know it very well. And now to hear you describe it, it's like, yeah, you know what? It's such a tough enough to crack for so many reasons. Um, you know, and, and obviously, you know, some of the, the new arrivals, um, are focused on particular niches because they can't go mass market because it's just too competitive and too difficult to break that. Um, well, it's um uh, you go to a trade show today and you got uh and i think i mentioned this to you on our last talk look what's going on in the exercise business the people they're, they've gone pre-barbell expecting better results with flipping a tire and jumping off a box and climbing a rope well, that's what they did before the barbell was invented and, and they're, they're expecting better results than what the barbell would produce and that barbell was, as we talked before, a major quantum leap forward in providing more exercise through a greater range of motion, harder exercise, and refined exercise to stimulate these large muscles. And, and of course, as we talked before, the, the barbell became a competitive tool in three different sports, Olympic weightlifting, bodybuilding, and powerlifting. And so the masses – would would attach that stigma with those three sports. If I if I do that, I'll be one of those people, and that's not what those are superior athletes that compete in a in a in a, in a format, and uh, so there's there's a tool sitting there, but it's never used because people don't understand the value of overload. And that's and you got to go back to basics. The best definition of exercise that I ever saw was not in a physiology books in college, which I took, I took over 30 hours of physiology courses in an undergraduate graduate program, plus a thesis. And I just learned how to do a paper and I learned, you know, a few things, but it, it was almost like Greek to be honest with you until you get out in the real world. But Arthur Jones designed, actually defined exercise properly to me. You must have a source of resistance. Therefore, e proper exercise is movement against resistance. And exercise, exercise does nothing for you while you do it. It provides the potential stimulus to trigger a positive response in the human body. And that was pretty, pretty black and white. Very simple. I, it, it's logical. Now, what exercise will do if done improperly is tear tendons and ligaments and rip a muscle, maybe break a bone. And, and you've seen that in uh, competitive sports like Olympic weightlifting, uh, powerlifting. Uh, now it's in general fitness because they're doing things, jumping off boxes with weights on their back for explosiveness. Uh, I mean, and flipping a tire, pushing a car, well, there's no eccentric loading. You're, you're missing half the exercise. So this is what, goes back to the opinions of exercise. Everybody's got one of them, you know, everybody's going to throw their two cents for it. So you're having to overcome, you're having to go up the mountain pushing a rock to try to 
educate and teach people. Yeah, it's a tough, tough challenge. But I know, I think, you know, certainly with my podcast, you know, it's, it's, whilst I might not do much about maybe, maybe not able to affect the uh, equipment industry, um, like I'd like to, maybe who knows long term. Um, it's certainly helping increasing the awareness of intelligent exercise, you know, of actually practicing safe high intensity training whether that's body weight whether that's with free weights or with machines um and that's all i guess we can hope to do in the short term as you said there's a massive um you know there's a, there's a huge you know health and fitness industry that's so uh you know spreading the wrong message and causing people to injure themselves and romanticizing stuff that's just ineffective right um so do you want to, I guess, for those that are listening to this that maybe aren't familiar with what it actually is, it means to exercise safely um, and are, are perhaps already uh, making the mistakes in terms of exercising incorrectly, you know, do you want to just elaborate on that in terms of, uh, to kind of inform that listener to help them make sure they make the well, right decisions? Yeah. I, I, do, I go to great lengths to keep things very simple. Um, and I have people come to visit my home here. I'm in uh, a suburb of Orlando, Florida, which you have an open invitation to come down sometime if you ever can be here. I'd love to. Uh, I've got a 1,200-square-foot workout room I built. Uh, it was my showroom for MedEx, and uh, now it's just my workout room for me. But I've got a, an interesting story to tell, and I've got 39 pieces of equipment, some of the original Nautilus machines, some of my favorites that I had in my gym 44 years ago, I had them restored, repainted, and I use them because function dictates design, and it doesn't change. So I have provided in my home a way of training my muscular structures through the full range of motion in the safest manner possible. And I reference uh, for those who are starting out, or those who are involved and don't have access to that equipment, They just have the conventional barbell, dumbbell, cable systems, whatever you may have. Go online. Ellington Darden, who you know who he is, uh, was our Ph.D. and uh, in-house researcher with Arthur. Ellington Darden did an unbelievable job in providing books for educational purposes, which we gave away as part of the package, just to uh, added value and premium to give something away to somebody when they came in and became a customer. And I still buy those books. and I buy them in two dozen lots. It's called the New High Intensity Training Book, which was published in 2004 because he has cataloged and organized a, a history of the of the uh, Arthur Jones era, uh, talking about the bodybuilders and, and the people because he competed in the uh, uh, Mister America collegially and won it. Uh, and he talks about proper use of conventional tools, whatever tools you may have. It's all there in one book. Uh, also, of course, uh, ArthurJonesExercise.com. John Turner's going to great lengths to put uh, every article he wrote, and that's even that's very deep reading. It takes a long time and a lot of second reading to understand a lot of his uh, comments, but those are two great references I recommend. And I give that book away when somebody comes to visit me. If they don't have it, I'll give them a copy just as a personal touch. Uh, no monetary gain there, but I'm just trying to educate them because that that, that is reference. So uh, uh, back to your question, uh, keep things simple. It's not complicated. Uh, Arthur Jones wrote an article in 1974 in Athletic Journal called Everything You and I Need to Know About Exercise in Less Than 1,000 Words. It's very simple. You select exercises for the large muscles, starting with the largest to the smallest. No more than 12 exercises in any given routine. You do one set to momentary muscular failure. You select a resistance. This is a guideline, as you know, that uh, if you cannot get eight reps, the weight is too heavy. If you exceed 12 reps, it's too light. And that's a safety factor because he, he understood that if you try to do a one-time maximum or a lower number of reps with a heavier weight, you're putting your joints, tendon, and ligaments on a, a high-force situation to cause maybe an injury. And that's what you want to avoid. And he also said, if you get hurt 
while exercising, you're doing something wrong. Well, basically, this article is less than a thousand words. It summarizes everything you need to know. Don't train more than three times a week. This is back, you know, 44 years ago. Now, in the 90s, he adjusted that. He realized that, that was probably too much. And I, and I realized back in my day, we tried to train three times a week, even in our heavy schedules of flying around the country, the world, going here, going there. We, we, we never missed a workout. And we could find a gym ahead in Nautilus. We go get a workout no matter what city we're in. Well, we were grossly overtraining. We were stimulating, but we weren't recovering. So uh, that's a learning curve over time. And uh, this article was, I mean, basically uh, real simple, just basic guidelines, which L. Darden in his book points all that out. So more is not better. Uh, you know, as you know, the West Point study was done in 1975, which basically covered the, the whole parameter of flexibility, range of motion, muscular strength, and cardiovascular change. And the results were stunning. That had never been done in the exercise physiology laboratories or any college study any place in the country at that time. And that was that that basically put the company on the map. That and Casey Viator winning the 1971 Mr. America contest and his last workout was recorded and discussed in print about what he did in less than under 28 minutes. Well, bodybuilders work out two or three hours a day, five days a week, but they really don't. But they have you believing they do, and they have you believing they work out hard, which they don't. So, having said that, you know it's it goes back to everybody's got an opinion, everybody's you know doing their thing. You know, so it's hard to change them. That it oh, is. Oh, it's hard to break. <laughs> um, the. Uh, you mentioned Casey Vietor just then. Uh, are you referring to the Colorado experiment? Is that the same? Well, that came did that later. lead up that to? Came that later. came later, did it? That came later. That was in '73. Yeah, he uh, he had uh, been injured in an accident in a in a shop mm -hmm. and uh, lost part of his finger, his little finger, and had a, a, a very strong allergic reaction to a tetanus shot, and then uh, went down. To, he almost died, from what I understand, and went down to about 166. Point six pounds of weight. Now he had already had that muscle mass built up previously in several occasions, you know, for these contests because he competed. But uh, the whole purpose of the Colorado experiment was, to, uh, and Arthur participated. Uh, I found out later on it was good for Arthur to get away, take a break, and get 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 his health back because this guy never. I mean, he he wore himself down. He was going. I mean, hard. Every day he drove it home and he, and he built, built that brand, built that business. And he was on top of it. He ran the show. I mean, there's no question about it. So that, uh, 28 day, uh, program was interesting. And it also, I, I learned, uh, later on, a guy named Pavo Comey was a Finnish researcher who had done some work with the lifters in Finland with eccentric loading, lifting, you know, picking the weight up for him and lowering the weight in the lifts to do negative only training. Uh, so at that time, he was the top dog in research uh, in the physiology labs with eccentric loading. And I, he just happened to be in Orlando at a conference, and I went out and personally met him and drove him up to meet Arthur Jones in the 70s. But uh, Ellington Darden had got, had seen him over in Munich in 72 during the Olympics and introduced himself, and he got his literature. He sent the uh, studies he had done to Ellington Darden, and he showed Arthur Jones, and they started training negative only in the Kwanzaa hut at DeLand High School with some pro football players during their offseason. Phenomenal results. And as a result, that prompted Arthur to design a series of research tools called the Nautilus Omni Machines, where you could assist yourself to lift the weight with your feet and lower the weight for your upper body, like shoulder press, chest press, bicep curl, tricep extension. And uh, they took those tools to Colorado State. Dr. Elliot Please, the exercise physiologist, was in charge of the whole deal. And they collected all the data. And had, I think Casey had 14 workouts in 28 days and had a net gain of about 65 pounds of mass because he'd lost 18 pounds of uh, fat, uh, according to the, to, to the data. And uh, But the purpose was to show the value 
of briefer exercise and, and less time required, harder work. So, so, and that accomplished. So that, that, that got people's attention back in that, at that era, at that time. So. Yeah, and obviously it's a very controversial experiment um, and it's been spoken about a lot, quite a lot since. Uh, and yeah, this, that's the thing, isn't it? It's like we all know that Casey had great genetics. He had bodybuilder genetics. Um, but it's not, that's not the point. The point is, look how brief and infrequent his training was and the gains. You know, that's, that's the, the main finding. Um, he get, you know, that, 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 uh, that experiment and, and kind of, uh, study comes under a lot of fire because some people believe that Casey was on steroids. How do you respond to people that say that? Well, that claim? Uh, at, at the time, Arthur Jones was given the word because he he had he was adamant against any kind of drugs. Period. I, mean, I saw that a lot. He he would tolerate, and he had the word of Casey Viator. Uh, he had the word of Mike Mincer and the Mincer brothers, Boyer Co. Now, I can't speak, uh, but knowing what I know about the bodybuilding culture today, after being involved in this thing since the late 60s, early 70s, and, and, and I'm pretty disappointed. Uh, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether Casey did or did not. I don't know. Uh, but I know I've been around this thing and I'm not a real big fan of it. You know, I think that's the extreme. What happened to the, the good old days for of, of health and fitness and, uh, striving to achieve physical perfection. That's, that's gone out the window and it's become a cesspool of drugs and, and, uh, all kind of weird. I, I'm not part of that. I, I just don't care for it. I'm a physical educator. Uh, I come from the health side and, uh, I tell people, when you, as you get older, you better get a little stronger so you can hold up a little longer, you know, but don't abuse your body. And uh, I don't fool with Mother Nature. Everybody has different DNA. Everybody's different. And you start fooling with your hormone levels and things, and you're not under supervision of some uh, medical expert. You're, you're rolling the dice. I don't care who you are. And that's all I'll say. But uh, I, I, I hope they didn't, but who knows? With that culture. You, you don't know. So, yeah, and to, well, look at today. Look at the philosophy of today's athletes. They will do anything to get to that top pinnacle, and they'll take anything. I mean, they they. they and if you look at the magazines, they they think they can eat their way or take the uh, pills, the magic magic potions to get to the top. When in fact, it goes back to uh, exercise as a requirement. In fact, you've got. Look at the uh, six factors that are necessary to sustain life. You got to have oxygen, air. You got to have water. You got to have food. You, you got to have gravity. If you didn't have gravity, we wouldn't be standing up. And you got to have exercise. Five, five factors, and and people aren't aware of that. They don't even think about it. But if you don't have water and air, you don't. It, the exercise doesn't matter. All these things come into place. So, you know, it's it's not complicated, but people are trying to complicate it. It's common sense, quality of life. I I just be curious, you know, you I wasn't sure how involved you were with the experiment, uh, but I know you've obviously trained and uh, and seen some of the greats train. Is there any stories that come to mind of what? um of clients who you know people like Casey, people like Sergio Oliva, or fill in the blank, who you remember having particularly impressive workouts or seeing that? I uh, had uh, well, Dick Butkus, for example, not to drop names. He was on our staff. He was a paid employee for eight years. Arthur Jones uh, rehabbed his knee, and it was almost too late so he could play his last year of pro football, which he did. He actually did that on one leg. I still speak with him on a regular basis. We just spoke last week. He's in Malibu, California. Uh, Dick Butkus was uh, – a, a man of uh, just pure toughness. He came from the ethnic neighborhood where he grew up, 11 kids in a family. Football was his ticket out, and he would do it all over again just like he did it then. He'll tell you that. And uh, we got to room together, travel together, and uh, what an interesting guy. Very smart guy, hardworking guy. And uh, if you look at Dick, 
uh, Arthur would have he and I sit down on the floor, and I'm right at 6'5", and he's 6'3". Well, he's got a long torso. I don't. I got long legs. So he's two inches taller than me when we sit on the floor. When we stand up, I'm two inches taller than he is. So there's your leverage factor. He was perfect for the position of fullback and linebacker. Short legs, long torso, and long arms. Perfect for linebacker. And he was so quick off the first five yards that uh, he, a uh, hundred yard dash, that's a whole other story. But for the first 10 yards, Dick Buckus was powerful and quick in long arms. But they hired a strength coach his last two years of football, his eighth and ninth year. And the guy had a credential. He was a 56 Olympic uh, silver medalist. And they introduced the bench press. Well, Dick never lifted weights other than one time when he was in junior high going out for a swim team. Think, Picture that one. And he did a power play and broke his wrist. He never touched a weight again. Now, how do you stay in shape? He, play, he, he lifted furniture and delivered furniture during the offseason in college, high school, uh, but never touched weights. He was rugged and raw bone, tough. But he flunked his bench press with the Bears. He couldn't bench press his weight twice. It's got nothing to do with football. Why is he in the Hall of Fame? Because Dick Buck has had an unusual skill set. He had the right leverage. He had the right fiber typing. He was quick, powerful, strong, even though he had poor leverage. But he was ideal for the linebacker position, and he had a killer instinct that was phenomenal. He was tough. So rest my case. Yeah, it's funny. You obviously you mentioned the the combine earlier. Um, you know, I I I wouldn't say follow it closely, but I'm a I'm a big basketball fan, so I check in with the NBA every now and again. Uh, obviously, I, I I play basketball, and uh, you did as well. Um, and you know, I remember learning that Kevin Durant. I think he, you know, because he's not obviously a big guy. Um, uh, for those that don't know, Kevin Durant plays for uh, Golden State Warriors as a forward. Uh, about six, he's seven foot tall, isn't he? Uh, he's about, I think he's six, six nine, six ten. Six, um, ten. Very wiry, but very. very sorry, go on. He he is a phenomenal shooter. Unbelievable player, yeah. but it's just he, funny because obviously you know when he, at the combine like he he can bench press hardly anything for reps. Uh, I can't remember the exact numbers, but you know that's kind of to be expected. He's got incredibly long arms, some big levers, and uh, you know is is it doesn't have a great deal of muscle mass. And I'm assuming not a great deal of strength, um, but it doesn't mean he's you know he's now a, an, an all star multiple years in a row. So, well, that goes back to a good question. What you just said right there is great. Uh, he is strong. He's stronger than you think, but he's got poor leverage for strength feats. Right. But his hookup neurologically, I guarantee you, that guy's powerful. He can move up the court like a like a gazelle. And I guarantee it. Six six nine six ten, and uh, you'd be surprised. Now, the problem is nobody's really probably trained him. And, and I'll give an example. I, if you ever watch college basketball, watch Notre Dame. Uh, there's a kid number 33, John Mooney. He's a sophomore at Notre Dame. His daddy brought him to me when he was 11 years old. And I turned him down. And I said, you don't need me to train him at 11 years old. He's he's a kid, but he was six foot one at, at 11. <laughs> All right. I said, but this, wait a while. And here's a problem today with sports. And I, I, I'm against this. And I, I, I'm not putting myself in a, a bad position, I hope. But. They're overplaying these kids. They're overpracticing. Everybody's making money on fall ball, travel ball, uh, team ball, this ball, that ball. And the kid, the parents want to give their kids the best opportunity, so they're playing them year round. Well, this kid's father brought him back to me at 14 years of age. Just up the road here, going into his freshman year, I started training. At that time, at 14, Lawrence, he was six foot seven, 200 pounds in a 15 shoe that's way above the norm for 14 years of age would you agree absolutely <laughs> so i kept very accurate records and i trained him two times a week out of season the summer comes along and the uh he had a verbal commitment to the university of florida and they wanted to go play on a team travel team ball and he uh, you need to do this because we want you ready when you come to college 
I don't like verbal commitments for kids. It's a one-way street. I'm against that. That's my opinion. I'm just giving you an opinion. Nonetheless, he had one. He's going to be a gator. So he uh, goes away, plays all summer, comes home. I train him once a week, once every two weeks when I could. He came home right before school started. He had an appendicitis, major surgery. Now he's behind the curve. Has a great freshman year, 25 points a game. Weighed 220, by the way. Put on, we put 20 pounds on him. He's growing, stimulating, he's growing, keeping very accurate records. At the end of the season, we start training him again. Then the next summer, he's got to travel all summer long, in and out, in and out, in and out. So we had to adjust the work has to fit that schedule. He came home with mono right before school starts. He's, he's knocked out of the box. You're, you, that's the time you're growing. That's the time you should be training, get stronger, and resting. He's playing year-round. He ends up being Florida Mr. Basketball his senior year. Coach Donovan goes to the Oklahoma Thunder. They bring a new coach in, and his dad pulled the horns back, and everybody came after him. And uh, Billy Donovan, being the class act he is, made a call to Coach Mike Bray up at Notre Dame, and uh, they brought him up there for a weekend, Labor Day, and he he was phenomenal. And they said, this kid, we want him. So he's at Notre Dame. He's playing as a sophomore quite a bit now, doing very well. They love him. He's six foot. No, he went away to college and we, 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 I still train him when he comes home. Six, nine, two forty five. <laughs> now that wasn't three days. Uh, that wasn't uh, five days a week, split routine, two and three hours in the gym every day. The workouts were under 30 minutes and he has a work ethic and he trains hard, but he gets it and he's good academic. So it's just, it's a breath of fresh air to have an impact an influence from afar in helping this young man in his life. So uh, keep an eye on him. He, he may play somewhere. He, he, I know he'll play in Europe for sure, but he's gonna, he'll be successful no matter what he does. Amazing. Because of his attitude and his, uh, his work ethic. So I'm going to, I'm jumping straight onto YouTube after this to uh, uh, see if I can catch he, some highlights. <laughs> yeah. Name basketball. He's quite a guy. That's I great. tell him, I said, I said, John, we never train your calf muscles because you got the biggest calf I've ever seen. You don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> I have a similar Fine problem. I have a similar. Th- I have big calves, but I'm quite, you know, I'm slim up top, well, you know. Arthur Jones never trained his calves. I never. Didn't have to. He <laughs> right. had big calves. <laughs> it's funny. I was, at, I was at a wedding um, a couple of days ago, and I've got a friend who's particularly muscular up top, but has very small calves. And like anything, the thing you don't have is the thing you want the most, right? And people that have it just take it for granted. I have big calves. I've always took it for granted. I've never done any direct work on my calves. And he's convinced that he can do something to, and I'm like, it's just genetics. Like you can't like, well, <laughs> maybe it, tiny it, increments, but that's, that's the whole, and, and you know, back in the day, we didn't understand that back in the were you growing up. We, we believe what we read in the muscle magazines, which is, uh, what did they rename muscle fitness, muscle and fiction. I think when somebody said that one time, but <laughs> you're right. It, it, the, the size of the muscle is, is predetermined at birth based on its origin to insertion, the length of it. And the, uh, the longer the tendon, the smarter the muscle length or shorter the muscle length. And of course, the longer the muscle, better the shorter the tendons. And if you look at the, these bodybuilders, they have the superior genetics for most of those muscles to have that potential size and they have to develop it, obviously. So. Yeah, I learned I learned about that a lot actually in the book you mentioned earlier, the new high intensity training. Darden uh, talks quite a bit in there of regard to you know the the kind of genetic limiting factors about things like wrist size and the spacing between your elbow joint and your bicep insertion, I think, and a few yep. other things as well, which were really. Um, Really interesting. And I also think for anyone who's listening to this who is a hard gainer or someone who struggles to put on muscle, um, I think the sooner you can accept that obviously you have genetic limits and these can't these are quite clear, especially when you look at some of these these uh measurements. Um it's quite liberating because then you don't chase it for the rest of your life. I mean, how many people try and chase this superior muscular development when it's totally out of reach and waste well, that's so good, much time that's good, and energy? That's a good point you just made, and that goes back to the whole origin of the whole fitness business. It's all based on hope. They're selling hope to everybody. That's why all these ads are designed. I've got the magazines going back to the nineteen thirties that Milo Steinborn gave me when he passed away. 
And you look at these magazines from the 30s to the 70s, and you look at the – it's the same thing, uh, trying to promote, sell the products to get you to buy them because they're reusable. And uh, all these routines, uh, you, you see the picture of the guy, and you think, well, gosh, if I do that exercise, I'll look like him. No, you won't. And that, it's just – it hasn't changed. It's today, even uh, – it's the same in a different format, but still the same. It's, it's all about trying to sell hope. What was it Mike Mency used to say? People would ask him how they could look like him, and he'd say, you have to pick my parents or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, Mike and Ray Mincer, they, they were down for a while. Boy, you call all three. Superior, phys- I mean, superior physiques, phenomenal genetics, and uh, they, 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 uh, they reached the pinnacle of, of success in their own right in, in, that, in that culture. And uh, uh, I know uh, Ray, Ray was extremely strong. He was very strong. El Darden, by the way, uh, you know, you're talking about the, the genetics and the muscle length and the tendon length and the shortness and things. Uh, you know, basically, he won the Mr. Collegiate America uh, during the Casey training era. And, it, and that was it for him. He realized, because he is intelligent, that that's about as far as I can go because of my bone structure. All right. And uh, the muscular the origin from the origin to insertion, the, the tendons were a little bit longer. He didn't have it. He got close, but he developed a great physique and in, 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 during his time at that level in college. And he was, he's been around it. And he's been a student of the game ever since he was a football player in high school. So, so uh, he's to be complimented. Mm, absolutely. Um, I'd like to just, uh, I guess we've got a few, few more minutes yet. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, your, your current training protocols, Jim. So how do you, what does your personal workout look like? Well, I, I've got, uh, I tell people that come here, I said, my room represents the equipment that I uh, was partial to. Uh, it shows a history based on function. I've got 39 pieces of equipment, mixed Nautilus and MedX, all the MedX. I don't have any barbells in here. I have a thick bar for forearms. Uh, I train on the equipment. I write a routine up. I have the ability at this house. If I, if you came here and trained with me for one year, say you did that, and I trained you two times a week for that's 104 workouts in a year. I have the ability and potential never to duplicate the same workout twice. Uh, that, that, that and that's a fact. That's amazing. Having said, having said that. I pick a routine now of no more, maximum 10 exercises. Uh, I believe in training the neck. I train the whole body. I work large muscle to smaller. Although, having done this this long, it really doesn't matter where you start, you know, at this age and as uh, long as you train. But I still adhere to the principles. I take an exercise to a momentary muscular failure. I do different routines. We do different speeds of movement, but we never accelerate. We do not do ballistic, uh, explosive lifts of any type. In fact, when in doubt, slow it down. But Arthur Jones always referred to a comment in his early writings, and that was a point that's controversial, as you know. There's some doing a lot of different routines with real slow movements and this and that. And uh, he said, when in doubt, back off, slow down. However, having said that, if you move too slow, your results may be counterproductive. And that, that's a good point. I won't go into detail on that today, but uh, L. Darden does come up here. He lives in the southwest part of town, about 40 minutes from here, and he'll bring some of his people over here on Saturday. And we, we train and bond and uh, go to lunch, and we come up with routines. So we've done all types of different speeds of movement. Uh, we do a 30-second negative, a 30-second positive, and a 30-second negative. That's 90 seconds. We'll do a 30 15, 30, or a 30, 10, 30. We'll do a five, 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 five up, five down, which to me is very safe. And there's no momentum and you can't cheat. And it's, it's tough. Or we'll train pre exhaustion, regular two to three up, three to four down. But I'll, back to my uh, training, I, I take about no more than 10 exercises a given workout, but it takes me a minimal 10 day recovery period oh really but by age my strength level and i got long arms and long legs but i'm pretty wired up 
in my sleep pattern. I'm also in another business. I consult to one of the best steakhouses called Christner's Prime Steakhouse. If you ever come down here, you'll be my guest for the best steak you ever ate. How's that? <laughs> That'd be amazing. And they're, they're, I've been with them. I'm in my 15th year. The uh, the owner was uh, a dear friend. I was his first corporate customer back in uh, 93. We were doing courses at the University of Florida Medical School with Arthur Jones. I bring all the healthcare people here, put them in a hotel, bus them up. All day long, come back and feed them the last supper before they went home the next day. So the owner of the steakhouse, uh, just a dear man, he flew for Ross Perot. He was his jet pilot in Texas when he ran for president years ago out of Texas. And uh, we got to be good friends. And in 2003, he asked me to come help him and uh, basically inform me that he was terminally ill. So I couldn't turn him down. So I'm in my 15th year. So I have a night business I'm involved in. And that, that kind of wears you down. So I have to really pace myself and spread it out. So you have to realize that uh, age, number one, uh, lifestyle, you're working, what you're doing. And so my sleep patterns may not be normal. And uh, so, but I'm still active. And uh, I get to see people that uh, come through the restaurant and kind of help manage it and operate, do a lot of marketing, do a lot of radio shows, sports legend shows, dinners, and bring a lot of business in. So we're, I'm still active. So my routine is spread out. I don't train three times a week. I don't train two times a week, but I, I work hard enough to stimulate and hold on to muscle mass. And I'm trying to do that at my older age because I see the, I see the benefits and I understand that, Hey, I want a good quality of life, whatever I got left. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I know. I mean, you look great. So it seems like you're doing the right stuff. Um, what, 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 you know, a lot, a lot of my listeners are, um, you know, older men who are interested in, you know, training over the long term and how they can preserve, you know, quality of life going into older age. Um, have you got any other tips like dietary or otherwise that you want well, to share? I, I keep it real simple. Uh, eat a basic diet. Uh, give yourself a pinch test on the abdomen because that's the fat stores area for a male and if you're pinching a little more fat there than normal and you're eating too many calories cut back but i know this by building that muscle up you burn more calories than rest that's a given and uh last january i, I just told myself i took uh 22 pounds off between january and july slowly and never lost any strength on it i keep very accurate records of what i do in my movements the patterns i choose and uh uh, I was just getting a little sloppy, undisciplined during the winter time. I said, you know, I know better than this. So uh, uh, get plenty of rest, stimulate the body, recover. Uh, if you can't come back and duplicate that workout like you did last time, that means you uh, haven't had enough recovery. It's real simple. You hit a certain plateau, back off a little bit, get more rest, and then go have a good quality of life. The foundation of your exercise program should be building muscle tissue so you can have a better quality of life. Just, just on that, you know, um, talking about plateauing and recovery and training frequency, um, you know, you've trained for many, many years. I've trained for a fair few years. I've trained long enough, well, probably six or seven years in this way. So long enough to, I guess, reach my genetic potential. Um, so it's very much, you know, from here on out, kind of incremental, very marginal gains. However, you know, I, I just wonder, you know, isn't there... I'm not sure. I just want to challenge that notion of, you know, because what you said there, if I understood that correctly, it's almost like you're saying, well, look, if you haven't improved on your last workout, that you should back off. But surely you can't improve indefinitely. Isn't there, isn't there just a case that yeah. you eventually there's, there's, plateau and that's… Yeah, yeah. it's going to come plateau there. Uh, you, and then, of course, you know, you, uh, after age 40, you lose 1% of your muscle mass statistically uh, called sarcopenia, which they identified back in the 90s, I believe. And that's part of the aging process. But they have shown now that by stimulating that muscle, you can actually slow that down and uh, enhance your quality of life. So I, I tell people, you better get a little stronger so you can hold up a little longer. Having said that, you have to modify your routine based on limitations placed on you. Like if you've got injuries on your shoulder or your knee, you've got a certain range of motion that you can't work. You've got to adjust that. Um, I still have that competitive drive. I'm going to push it as hard as I can proper form, go to a failure. And as long as you're doing that, you're guaranteed that you stimulate something and uh, let the body recover it. Monitor your pulse rate during the workout, keep it at a target zone that you're supposed to, and then uh, stimulate recover. But my workout takes me an under 35 minutes, and I do anywhere up to 10 exercises. And 
one set. And if you do another set, then drop something else. Don't start adding more, 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 because you then you reduce the quality of the work. So, do you um, when you hit failure in a given exercise, do you continue to contract and in, in, inroad uh, for a certain number of uh, seconds? Or no, I've done some static holds, and we'll do you know like uh, a, a, maybe a ten second hold just to finish it off. But that's, mm. I mean, where do you draw a line? I mean, it's like how many negative reps do you need to do? You. I did a test for Arthur Jones way back when. It was called the 57 to 1 test ratio uh, on a prototype uh, servo motor driven uh, knee testing machine that was never marketed, but was used for research only. And we were showing the, uh, the friction component. Now, you have a 1.4 to 1 ratio in a fresh muscle, and you know that. If I give you 100 pounds and you curl it one time, you can't get 101 second time or first time. You can't curl it, but you can lower it slower but you can't lift it well i give you 40 percent more weight that's 140 pounds you'll lower the 140 as efficiently as you curl 100 but that ratio changes as fatigue sets in and we took my knee my right quad unfortunately the the, the computer program was only uh, limited to 25 repetitions we started off 1.4 to 1 ratio but on the 25th rep I couldn't even get my leg up. I mean, I can barely get my leg up. Extended, the eccentric loading factor ratio to the positive rep was 57.1 to 1. Wow. Um, I mean, so I could have done that all day long. For what? What's the point? Mm. All right. So, I mean, there's all things you can come up with. Anything you can do to make it harder for the moment within that 90-second guideline, as long as it's not ballistically, it, it's okay. It gives you variety. There's several books out. I think uh, John Little wrote some contraction books. Those are those are valuable. Those are great things to add to try. It's an arsenal, and uh, if you're successful with it, use it. As long as you don't hurt anybody. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, I hear exactly what you're saying, and so many of the listeners are familiar with obviously the 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 considerations around overtraining. Um, I guess it's just you know when you say train to failure, I find. I, what I found talking to a lot of people in high intensity training is um, there's sometimes an issue with semantics. Training to muscular failure can mean different things to different people. So, you know, wh- yeah. the way I always look at it is, you know, you're, you've hit, you can't move anymore in a given exercise, and then you maybe just contract for a further five to 10 seconds to try, and then you slowly lower the resistance down to the starting point. That's kind of how I personally yeah, define well, we it did, we did force negatives after the when you right. fail on a positive note positive negative you have force reps where do you draw the line i mean how I many I mean, you can do force reps for a long time i mean you make such a deep inroad once you've done that now how long is it going to take to recover from that hmm. so uh you know as long as you're getting results and you're seeing change and you're doing something right if you're not getting hurt you're doing something right but it's not complicated. But people, we have a tendency to try to change things. I mean, I saw people years ago, Lawrence, on the machines would do a reverse facing the pad doing a shoulder press. For what? But they changed. The machine wasn't designed for that, but they did that. You know, they, they did, I mean, they come up with crazy things. You know, uh, it's sometimes there's an irrational situation out there, and those things happen. But, uh, if you use the tools the way they're designed and intended to be used, you use them under the guidelines and protocols, you'll get some benefit. That's how you look at it. We've got. Um, I'm just checking. Are you okay for time, Jim? Because I wanted to ask you some some business sure. questions quickly. Sure. But, okay. Cool. Sure. So we've got we've got, well we've got another sort of 19 minute schedule, but we'll just see how it goes. Um, You've obviously, you know, got a lot of experience in the fitness business, more than well, more than most in terms of the strength training business. And I do uh, really respect your modesty earlier. You know, when you kind of caveat things and said, "Look, I I didn't get involved in the design," you know, and and I appreciate that it's a, a collective effort. Um, but that being said, you know, you, you certainly know your stuff. I think, and and are in a wonderful position to help others uh, in terms of helping them build their own fitness businesses and obviously that's what you and luke are focused much on um when you talk to um strength training and fitness business owners today what are some of the the most the common problems that you see and and how can yeah how can how can they they perform a little better in your opinion well in in what the, the big 
the big change now has been a lot of these one-on-one personal training businesses. And uh, back in my era, we didn't know any better. We did personal training for free because we taught you how to use the equipment. We were there with you. We pulled the pins. We set your routines up. You had employees doing that. You had a salary employee working for you. Uh, today, the, the biggest problem in that business is the person starting it ends up being married to the customer and can't break away to do, do the proper marketing to drive people to the facil- facility. And uh, that gets them in trouble. They, they, they're, they're so tied in, they can't step out of the box to run their business like they're supposed to, to grow the business. They end up doing all the training. And uh, that's a problem. They've got to uh, be able to market, brand, uh, look at strategies to drive traffic to the front door. You know, uh, marketing is general and sales is specific. But then you have to have that person in there that can com- get that commitment from the, the uh, potential prospect to commit to signing up and spending the money. And uh, what I saw during my era was uh, all these degree people with uh, exercise physiology, PhDs, and this and that, and certified. Unless you can sell the program, you better you better get the right person who knows what they're doing because sales cures all. If you don't sell, you don't eat. And that's the bottom line. And that's a simple common sense. So, uh, and that person with the one-on-one training business is like, you can only train so many people a day. So, so you've got to stretch out. You've got to give up a little bit. You've got to get the right people in there under your guidelines and your philosophies that don't try to change you. And I saw a lot of that happening too. Once you had your established protocol and this is your mission and this is your philosophy, you start bringing people on board and they try to bring things in like Swiss balls and rubber bands and all these little chemists and gadgets. They're diluting your brand of what you're trying to accomplish. So I saw a lot of that along the way too. So it, it's just dealing with people. So, so yeah, the, that, the right mix. That's great. That's, that's really interesting. So yeah, people working in their business rather than on their business. Um, I think one of the, I mean, I've had, I talked to a lot of, um, like you, a lot of people in this business uh, about, you know, how, how they're going about growing their businesses. And I have heard people um, say that they find it very hard to find people, uh, find personal trainers who can replace them because they're already so indoctrinated by the the kind of, um, yep. you know, the kind of this other bad health and fitness messaging that we've already kind of touched on. So is that an ego thing? Does that person need to just like, you know, get on with it and hire someone and educate them? Or, or how do they how do they get around that issue, do you think? Well, it's like anything else. It's trial and error. Just like going to college, you, know, you get a lot of theory and you have to go through the tolerance test to get that degree. Most of it you'll never use, but you have to put up with it and get through it. That's part of it. But the problem is you have to go back to what are they teaching in the, in the academic environment? I mean, uh, I've got these kids today that I talk with, and they're in exercise science. Well, it used to be called physical education when I was in school, but they've got they've renamed it now. That no longer exists. It's exercise science. Well, they're teaching everything: explosive lifting, all that you see. You get this, this, and this, and you're confused. You believe this is well, this is what everybody's doing, so I got to buy into all that. And they don't have the the knowledge. They don't have the experience, and. Uh, they get uh, indoctrinated more or less in a way of a certain uh, protocol or philosophy. And uh, that, that professor walks on water and they believe that. So that, that's part of the deal. You know, you, you really don't, you really don't know much till you get out and do it. You got to go get the experience and you're going to make mistakes. I made some mistakes, but I learned from my mistakes. I'm still making mistakes. You know, you just, you know, you don't, you don't have all the answers, but, you have to go out and work and uh, you're only going to be measured by success in business by what you bring in there and pay the bills and stay in business. You got to stay in business. So uh, it's like, you never, and, and it's like uh, even in the steakhouse business, you don't lower your standards. You have, what took you to the dance is where you need to be. Don't delineate and don't dilute your brand, whatever that may be. You've got to hold on to that. And, and, and it's interesting to watch people when things get tough economically, the first thing they do is they cut back. When in fact, that's when Arthur Jones accelerated. He put he drove it home. 
he kept putting it out there. He never backed off. And, I, you, and, it, it, and it was that, that toughness, that tenacity, and that drive. He knew what he's going to accomplish. And he knew that he had to do it more now than before because things got tight. And that's, and I saw him, uh, and this is just, you know, based on what I observed, the guy never backed off and he flew that airplane knowing he had to pay for the fuel. But that prospect, all he saw was over here. God, this is first class. This guy took good care of me. Uh, they housed me. They fed me. I'm, I'm, I'm joining up. I'm signing up. I mean, the guy never backed off. He was tenacious. And that's what you have to be in business. You have to be tenacious. You've got to work smart. And uh, we were taught that over time. You learn to, you have to be tough to deal with what you have to deal with. Those those were overload systems to us. You know, we, we were put in situations where we had to survive, either sink or swim. And I, I think I mentioned to you before, I, t- I tell people, I look back now, I never took a Dale Carnegie course. I never took a Toastmasters course. I never took a sales course. I was put in positions where I had to sink or swim. I call it trial by fire. <laughs> so, I, and and I and I realized early on that hey, you, you, no matter where you are or how successful you become, you must always be humble because that'll get you in trouble. Arrogance. And I got a great quote. I may use this last time. I can't remember. I found this. This was a great coach who played at Notre Dame for Newt Rockney. He's passed on now. Frank Lee. Hey, I found this years ago. Egotism is the anesthetic that dulls the pain of stupidity. What a great quote. That's a great quote. And, and, you know, I just I, I always, you know, you treat people the way you're supposed to be treated and things will work out. And I always I tell people, these young people, when you're dealing with somebody in a situation where you're trying to accomplish something to get them to join your team, to be on your program or to to be a member, they're going to pay you money. They're going to buy something from you. Put them in front of you always. When you put that prospect and that customer in front of you, always, you have no worry. You have no problem because guess what? The greed factor is not there. It'll, it, you may get nailed a few times, but it'll work out for you in the end. Yeah, I completely that, agree. That's a simple common sense. Mm. And there's no substitution. As Bear Bryant, the legendary football coach, who I got to know, uh, I was one of the last people to see him alive uh, two and a half weeks before he died in 1983 uh, at the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles. I shook his hand on the elevator, had a great chat with him. And Bear Bryant always said there's no substitution for horse sense. <laughs> so. Um yeah, no, you said some really good stuff there, especially I completely agree with you about um sales. I you know, I've I've been through tons of different sales courses in my career. Um and whenever people say to me now, like, oh, they they ask for sales advice or, you know, how how to get good at sales, I'm like you know, just find the best salespeople in your organization. But like, ideally, they they typically, you know, the, the leaders, the, the the senior management, and just get in on client meetings with them and be a sponge. You know, and we've talked about a lot of obviously how you've observed Arthur during his career. You know, I was lucky that during my uh, last career with my my former employer, who had a tech company in London, that I got uh-huh. to sit. I got to sit with some incredible salespeople and see how they would you know, answer objections and explain ideas and all of that stuff. And I just, I just soaked it up. Um, So now I feel like that's the best thing young salespeople can do is just get around great people um, and watch them in action, you know? Success breeds success. Right. You know that, right? (laughs) Sure. You know, uh, leaders are basically uh, like eagles. They don't flock. You'll find them one at a time. Mm. They're different. They're unique, hmm. and salespeople uh, have uh, have a they have a gift, and I didn't know I had that gift, but I I had to realize I did have it because I had to survive at my gym. Like I told you last time when we spoke, I had enough money in the bank account to last for five months of expenses on fixed cost. That's all the money I had, and it was a crapshoot. And I opened up in the wrong time of the year, like I said, November first. Are you kidding me? I didn't know any better, but I had to. I had to get it started because I had to. Have, I had to build a business, and uh, I ate and slept that gym business night. I even stayed dinner at night, and um, so short term memberships conversion factor you know, in forty five days convert them over to a full year to two year deal, and gave a gave them credit for that first ninety days. See, 
I built that business quick in four months because I was desperate and uh, never looked back, but I was lucky, but it was hard work, you know? So uh, you, uh, you know, you don't, uh, you only learn by doing it. Mm, try, try by fire. You asked me a question. You, try by fire. You, you asked me about Steve Reeves. I forgot that we didn't talk about Steve, but, uh, uh, you want to comment yeah, on that? Okay. Just just before that, I just really want to underscore something you said. Um, Luke, uh, you know, you talked about, you know, how you got to stick by your values, your brand, you know, what it is that you are passionate about and uh, that makes you different in terms of your business. I think uh, Luke does this really well. Um, you know, he focuses on the three pillars, expertise, uh, strength training, and there's something else which I can't remember, which is bad for me. Um, but, you know, he's very strong on that um, yep. versus doing what you were saying that a lot of gym owners do, which is start getting involved in lots of stuff on the side, which isn't congruent with their core message. Um, well, Luke, Luke had experience at the high school level with the athletes. He was actually in, in business and didn't realize it because he was so organized. And I saw what he did at the high school level with the student athletes and uh, that bit, that model he could, and that's what he did. He took that from the athletic side in schools to the business model and perfected it. And of course he, uh, I, we set him up to talk to a lot of people, people in the field and he picked their brain. He went around spending time with them and uh, put his philosophy together and, and he's built his brand and that's, that's what he's doing. And he, and, He's going through trial and error with some people. Obviously, you can't get them all perfect the same, at, 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 you know, the first time. But uh, he's got a program and a protocol, and he's very successful. And you can't argue with that. And he's learning from it. So. I, I, what I love about him and, and about the community though is that he is seen as the um, certainly one of, if not the hallmark, when it comes to running successful strength training business. And it's great because a lot of the other guys, you know, guys like Owen Dockham and Skyler and these other people, they look up to Luke in a way. And they're, you know, he's been on the show a number of times on my podcast sharing what he's learned. And I just love that he's now become this icon who is now helping all these other people and and in and, and collectively we are growing this strength training um uh community which is really really fun and cool to see um did you want to yeah i mean i'm i really i'd love to hear you talk about steve reeves uh if you want to well, steve talk about reeves that. was just uh i got to know steve uh he did come visit in 1977 he spent three days with us and uh i ended up taking him back to my home and then taking him to the airport and getting him back to california uh, I met I met he and George Eiffel around about the same time, and they were two uh, of the best in their era during the John Grimmick era of the forties. And uh, he he was a, a, a true gentleman. Uh, even in his older years, was a phenomenal looking man. Uh, he, you could tell he was just almost perfect perfect symmetry. Uh, he had some uh, serious injuries. He had a real bad shoulder from a chariot wreck when he was filming uh, one of the movies, uh, the Sword and Sandal series of uh, Hercules and things like that in Italy. But he did a lot of things. He did a thing called power walking and wrote a book, you know, and uh, and he uh, was a byproduct of uh, barbell training, obviously, back in the 40s. Uh, very rigid diet. Uh, they used a lot of milk and cream and eggs and, you know, a lot of protein, that type thing. Uh, he, he, he was with us for three days. And, uh, you know, he was very opinionated about uh, what he accomplished. And uh, it's like Arthur Jones always said, when you go to the horse race, do you talk to the horse or the jockey? And and I saw a little bit of that then. Uh, he, he, there was things he was saying that just, I mean, was, I don't know. I, 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 but he was a very humble man, uh, very friendly. And years later, I saw him in uh, 1994 at, at, a, at a private celebrity big function. They were honoring certain people. It was in Redondo Beach in uh, November, and uh, he was the first person I ran into. Uh, he had his fiance with him at the time. Uh, he'd lost his uh, wife, his second wife, to a stroke in 1989, I believe. Uh, he was very successful. He uh, he raised Arabian horses, uh, lived out someplace outside San Diego. And the first thing he came up to me, he said, Jim, how are you? How's your son doing? And that was pretty touching and we had a nice chat 
And then I was in San Francisco in 2000. I got the phone call that he had died in the hospital. He had uh, dropped dead of an an aneurysm. Uh, He had been fighting a a lymphoma cancer, and he was in remission. And uh, there was the loss of uh, an icon in the field. I mean, it was just a legend. But uh, he was a nice man and uh, very polite and uh, had his opinions about it. And that's fine, you know, so. But I was blessed to get to meet, you know, people we grew up on looking in the magazines as kids, you know, that the movie Hercules, Hercules Unchained. So uh, Duel, Duel of the Titans with Gordon Scott. Those were the sword and sandal movies that we grew up on as kids. So anyway. Yeah. And no, I thank you for sharing that. Um, it's really cool to hear about some of the people that you've worked with and beat and met and, and spent time with. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, Jim, this has been a pleasure and I feel so honored to have you back on the show for a part two and this is this has been even better than the first one it's just really fun to talk about all these things with you um is there anything else you want to share with the listeners before i wrap well, up let me let me i'll just give my personal email if anybody would ever want to come down and visit uh i'm here uh i, I do book appointments to come by and visit talk training or do, you know whatever but I'll, I'll leave that with you it's uh yeah the initial jj flanagan f-l-a-n-a-g-a-n at CenturyLink, and that's connected, C-E-N-T-U-R-Y-L-I-N-K dot net. And uh, anything I do to help anybody out, I'm, I'm always a phone call or an internet uh, email away. So uh, uh, I appreciate you having me on the, on the show, and I wish you nothing but continued success. And I look forward to shaking your hand in uh, Minneapolis next month. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, so just for the listeners, uh, you know, Jim's email address will be in the, the blog post should you want to send him an email. Um, and yeah, we're both going to be at the uh, Resistance Exercise Conference in March. Um, and listeners will be sick of hearing this because I'm talking about it all the time. But uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd love for obviously you guys to come along as well. Uh, you know, Jim and I both be there. There's some amazing speakers. It's going to be a really fun couple of days. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, it'd be great to see you guys too. And there'll be details about the event on this blog post as well um jim did you want to talk about any other events that you're holding in the near future uh i don't know if there was anything else on, on uh that comes we've to got a course in april i think it's the fifth and sixth of april i believe uh, luke carlson he'll 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 notify everybody on that he's doing a mass media social media thing and they'll be in the orlando area here uh the two-day course for their personal trainers is that so, the real hit experience or is that the real that's yep. correct yes okay yeah. great I'll, I'll link to that as well so we can find out more about that event <laughs> as well um and for all the listeners um to find the blog post for this episode please go to corporatewarrior.co forward slash gym and that will take you directly to the blog post um, and to find the all other episodes for this podcast please go to corporatewarrior.org where you'll find a full list and until next time guys thank you very much for listening I hope you enjoyed that episode. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C-O-R-P warrior.com, to get your free high-intensity training Google progress chart and ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are deliberately not verbatim. Instead, they've been transcribed in an e easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, enter your email address, then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. 
To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So, this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course, and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support.